Hey, herzlich willkommen in der Seabase, herzlich willkommen beim 122. Netzpolitischen Abend. Ich bin endlich mal wieder dabei. Hallo, ich bin Sandra oder Aprika und ähm, freue mich total, endlich mal wieder beim Netzpolitischen Abend äh, euch durch den Abend zu führen und äh, mit euch gemeinsam äh, spannende Vorträge anzuschauen. Heute ist der letzte Netzpolitische Abend des Jahres. Ähm, so dass wir äh, auch einen Jahresausklang hier gemeinsam mit euch dann nach den Vorträgen machen können und ähm, uns dann auch besonders freuen, äh, nochmal über den äh, kleinen Kongress, der hier am Ende des Jahres äh, stattfindet, äh, mit euch kurz zu sprechen. Aber vorher möchten wir euch äh, einladen, die Vorträge anzuschauen, für die ihr hergekommen seid. Und zwar einmal von Tara Tariaki äh, und Fiona Krakenbürger zum Sovereign Tech Fund ähm, und dann äh, als zweites zu Datenanfragen.de von Loritz Sieben und Benjamin Altpeter. Und da freue ich mich auch schon besonders drauf. Äh, die beiden sind nämlich extra von weit her angereist, außerhalb von Berlin, außerhalb des S-Bahn-Rings. Genau, E-Punk spricht dann noch kurz zum Hacking in Parallel, zu dem kleinen Kongress hier rund um die Seabase äh, zum Ende des Jahres. Und als erstes möchte ich unseren Vorstand des Vereins Digitale Gesellschaft einladen, kurz zur Bühne zu kommen und euch alle zu fragen, ob ihr nicht äh, Geld dabei habt <lacht> oder Geld auf euren Konten habt. Genau, äh, kurzer Werbeblock für die Spenden. Nee, äh, mal im Ernst, also ich habe... Ähm Fangen wir anders an. Ich habe gestern ähm, erfahren oder mir überlegt, ähm, dass ich hier heute noch mal was sagen muss und habe dann ähm, hab da aus dem Fenster geguckt und habe da unten irgendwie eine Person Pfandflaschen sammeln sehen, irgendwie abends um 10 und irgendwie im Müllkram und dachte dann, das ja, ist irgendwie echt gerade eine Scheißzeit, um nach Spenden zu fragen. Ja, das muss man einfach mal so sagen. Das ist, ist erstens, weil das Geld knapp ist, ja, bei vielen glaube ich, und zweitens, weil wir alle merken, wir haben gerade vermeintlich oder wir haben existenziellere Probleme als irgendwie digitale Grundrechte, ja, whatever, sondern ähm, wir haben gerade irgendwie einen Krieg irgendwie, der, der nicht sehr weit weg ist, wir haben eine Klimakrise und wir haben eben das Problem Armut und deshalb können wir es gerade niemandem verdenken, wenn wenn er oder sie irgendwie das Geld woanders hinsteckt. Ja? Auf der anderen Seite sage ich mir, ähm, Freie digitale Kommunikation ist irgendwie, nicht nur irgendwie, es ist auch ein Mittel, wie wir diese Probleme angehen können und wenn wir irgendwie Plattformen haben, auf denen wir uns nicht mehr frei austauschen können, diese Sachen nicht mehr problematisieren können, wenn wir ähm, keine, keine vertrauliche Kommunikation mehr haben, weil unsere Chats gefiltert und kontrolliert werden, dann ähm, werden wir diese Probleme auch nicht lösen. Ja, und deshalb glaube ich, braucht es Organisationen wie die DigiGas, deshalb braucht es diesen Kampf für digitale Grundrechte und deshalb möchte ich euch nochmal bitten, die DigiGas zu unterstützen, unsere Arbeit zu unterstützen mit einer Spende und um es nochmal zu konkret zu machen, ich stand im September schon mal hier vorne und habe gesagt, uns fehlen ungefähr 25.000 Euro. So, und wir haben das schon ernst gemeint, ja? wenn wir dieses Geld nicht kriegen, können wir nicht weitermachen. Und ähm, seit, diesem, seit diesem Spendenaufruf sind irgendwie ein paar tausend Euro eingetrudelt, aber ein Großteil dieses Geldes, ich sag mal ungefähr 20.000, fehlt immer noch. Ja, und deshalb hier an der Stelle nochmal der Appell, wir meinen das ernst mit diesem Spendenaufruf. Ja? Die Lage, so haben wir auch den letzten Blogpost überschrieben, ja, die Lage ist ernst. Und ähm, genau. Deshalb will ich hier nochmal eine Lanze brechen. Unterstützt die DigiGas mit einer Spende. Wenn ihr, schon, äh, wenn ihr uns schon unterstützt, überlegt, ob wir das vielleicht hochschrauben könnt. Gebt vielleicht uns wenigstens so viel wie eurem Lieblingsdatenkapitalisten. Ja, also diese 10 Euro im Monat, die man da überall in diese Streaming-Abos steckt. Ja, überlegt euch, ob ihr nicht vielleicht auch so viel für die DigiGas geben wollt. Ja, ähm, Tom und Sebastian oder Epunk, die reißen sich hier gerade echt zum Jahresende richtig den Hintern auf. Wir ähm, Ehrenamtlichen sind am Wirbeln im Hintergrund, um den Verein noch mal äh, ein bisschen neu aufzustellen im neuen Jahr. Es passiert echt viel und ähm, dafür brauchen wir aber auch ein bisschen Kohle. Deshalb ähm, unterstützt uns. Die Lage ist ernst. Danke.
Danke, Benjamin. Und für alle, die jetzt nicht wissen, wie sie DigiGigas unterstützen können, äh, gibt es auf der Webseite natürlich eine Spendenseite. Man kann Fördermitglied werden und äh, ihr könnt auch hier äh, Geld in Briefumschläge oder in Spendendosen äh, legen. Genau, Dankeschön. Dann äh, kommen wir jetzt äh, zum inhaltlichen äh, ersten Vortrag und da freue ich mich äh, besonders, dass Tara und äh, Fiona heute hier sind, um den Sovereign Tech Fund äh, vorzustellen und vor allen Dingen vorzustellen, warum es diese Arbeit braucht. Und da der Vortrag äh, auf Englisch stattfindet, ihr könnt auch Fragen dann auf äh, Deutsch stellen auf jeden Fall, aber da der Vortrag auf Englisch stattfindet, äh, werde ich auch äh, die Anmoderation nochmal auf Englisch machen, damit das äh, äh, dann auch in der Aufzeichnung schön funktioniert. Um, welcome everybody to the CBase and to the Net Political Evening from Digitale Gesellschaft. I'm extremely happy today that the Sovereign Tech Fund team, uh, or two of them, uh, is here today to um, speak about why we need a Sovereign Tech Fund, like why open source tech infrastructure is crucial in our world today. And I'm happy that Tara Taraki and Fiona Krakenberger are here to introduce it to you and to speak about the topic. Welcome. Thank you so much for the invitation and the introduction. It's really, really cool to be here. Uh, just why we are setting up everything. Also, I want to say the Netzpolitische Abend is an institution and so the DGGES, I really, really appreciate the work so I can only support the call for action to donate and support this extremely important Verein and the work that you are doing. Um, as I said, it's good to be back. Um, it's been a long time. Uh, I really, uh, it, it's very exciting for me to be back here um, and to talk about the still pretty nascent initiative, the Sovereign Tech Fund, um, a fund that is dedicated to open source infrastructure in the public interest. I'm Fiona. I'm one of the co-founders of the Sovereign Tech Fund. I've been working open source for a long time. And I'm here today with my colleague Tara, who is the technologist at the Sovereign Tech Fund and working really closely with me um, on the program side of things. So today we want to... There are so many things, so many things have happened uh, since we started working on this. Um, so we picked a couple of things that we want to talk about. We probably have to rush through a little bit. If there are things that you want to address or talk about afterwards, feel free to um, hit us up. We'll be here for a while um, and also very much available for your questions. Um, we will talk today a bit about the challenges that we identified and that we are trying to address with the Sovereign Tech Fund. We'll talk a little bit about um, where we are today and what our future thoughts and ideas are. We are currently in a process where we are actively seeking input um, and feedback, so feel free to ask your questions. We also have some questions with us that we wanted to discuss with you. Um, yeah, looking forward to this. So, um, <laughs> I'm going to show you a cartoon. Quick show of hands. Actually, just out of curiosity, who has seen this cartoon before? Okay, well, this cartoon, actually, we've been joking that this cartoon um, you know, we are talking about open source infrastructure that is doing a lot of work, but also this cartoon is doing a lot of work. So we've been joking that the cartoon by now has to look like this. Uh, <laughs> because actually this cartoon is becoming this one critical thing that helps us since uh, 2020 to talk. Actually, it exists much longer, I think. Um, helps us to talk about the issue at hand. But um, so this is a joke that I wanted to make. I'm uh, glad some people understand it. But back to the um, content of this talk. Um, what this cartoon exemplifies, it still really works, works really well, is um, sort of a problem that we are seeing and a problem that is growing by the day. Um, and the problem is, no matter what you are using in terms of digital technologies, if you're using your phone, if you drive your car, if you open your laptop, if you use Zoom or any other platform to have a video call, if you use your open source technologies, um, also proprietary technologies, when you open them, you use software that has open source code in it, in one way or another. Um, and I mean, um, it doesn't have open source code, like just to explain it very, very uh, briefly, I, I don't mean open source technologies like OpenOffice or GIMP, but actually open source technologies that are used by developers to build other technology. So under the hood, when we use applications, are an immense number of open source core technologies like libraries, frameworks, programming languages, databases, um, what else, uh, server management software, um, those are all embedded in the code that we use. And which is amazing because it means that 
when you write new software, you don't have to write it from scratch. You can actually use all these technologies that are out there, free and open, available for your use as a developer, um, to build new software, which has propelled innovation because it enables us to build quickly new technologies. It helps you to make your application more secure, quick, fast, pretty. Um, you can use all these core technologies that are out there. And as I said, that's actually a pretty successful model because no matter what application you're using, there are guaranteed um, a number of open source core technologies embedded in there. Or th the developers have used something that is necessary to build it. Um, so no matter if you are a private user or a government or someone, a journalist with certain security needs or a large trillion dollar company, you are heavily dependent or even profiting from these open and freely available core technologies. Um, and the problem with that is, on one side of the equation, we have an ever-growing demand and more and more requirements for safety and functioning and up, up, um, uh, and, and um, uh, what you call it, resilience of these technologies. And on the other hand, you actually often have volunteers, you have individuals, extremely small teams, very small companies, maintaining, building, writing, and uh, taking care of these technologies. And this imbalance is growing by the day because we are building more technologies on top of these. On the other hand, we don't have more necessarily more support for these people working on these things. And um, I can strongly recommend, there's a uh, book that was written, actually pretty foundational for this space by Nadia Ekbal, which says, as the world blazes ahead into a modern age of startups, code and technology, infrastructure continues to lag behind and the cracks in the foundation are not obvious right now, but they are widening. So I think I can speak for a lot of people that are dealing with those things. The more you think about those imbalances and like how much pressure there is on volunteers, people working besides their day jobs on these things in their free time, the more shocking it gets and, and the more you wonder, well, we have a pretty large, large, large ecosystem built on a pretty brittle foundation that is not sustainable. And as I said, sometimes it works, but way too often it doesn't work at all. And it's extremely unsustainable, puts a lot of pressure on individuals um, and makes it very, uh, people are literally burning out because of that. And the reason why there is this big imbalance has several, like has many, there are many reasons for that. Um, I think one of them is with infrastructure, it's often you don't really think about it until it's broken. So like, the best outcome you can have is that you never see it, you never have to think about it, uh, which makes it hard, I think, to campaign for it and make it clear that people need to think about those imbalances and those, uh, frankly speaking, also injustices that are happening. Um, the other thing is that working on the maintenance of open source infrastructure is actually not sexy at all. Um, and like, like when we think about how, how politics also work, how you campaign for things, you can't say that, well, I, I want to, I want, my biggest goal is that nothing ever happens, right? The, like it, it just doesn't work that way. So it's also really hard to make, you know, to create, I mean, yeah, I, I agree that would actually be great, but, <laughs> um, but it's really hard to campaign for this matter. Um, and. Um, so, and also, I mean, for, for companies especially, where I think, frankly, it's the biggest injustice is happening, that there's so many companies profiting from it, it has worked sort of okay-ish, and there has no, not really been any, like, public outcry or scandalization of the fact that there's, like, huge companies profiting from work that is labor that is done for free under pretty strenuous circumstances. Um, so, and, and so the challenges that we see, um, I just summarize them here, but also Tara and I, and also the team at the Sovereign Tech Fund, we've been working in funding for a long time, like in different funding programs. And we know that the way that funding often works is part of the problem because it has a very, very heavy bias on innovation, on new things, on shiny things. And there are some structural reasons for that. Some of them might be that a fund usually has a funder as well. So, you know, you have to report on things, you have to campaign for your own fund. It's really hard sometimes to, you know, like th that sort of structural issue um, prioritizes new features, new things, applications, things that are that easy to tell a story about. The maintenance of existing things, it's, it's much harder to sell, right? So this, and also, I think there's also something like a, general obsession with innovation and new things. Um, also, when we look at all the sort of technology, not only open source funding, but also generally technology funding, startup funding, it's always about the new things. It's always something good, right? It's something 
that we are proud about, that we can tell, and it, it makes it easy to understand what we're doing. So um, that's also one of the reasons why funding um, for open source infrastructure is almost non-existent. And a couple of years ago, when we started working on this, there really weren't a lot of funders taking care of this. So we're just a couple out there. Um, and so when we started working on this two years ago, in 2020, there was actually uh, Tara and I, we've been working at the Open Technology Fund, which was one of the few funders out there that were even, they had the core infrastructure fund, but that was dedicated to open source infrastructure. Um, and in that time, OTF was actually heavily under siege by the Trump administration and made really a lot of people think, well, we only have a handful of funders or even just one funder who's specifically funding open source infrastructure. Um, and we have almost no redundancy in the field. So the, the sort of problems that we see in the technology world were transported to the funding landscape that we know very well. And in the last couple of years, a lot has hap happened, fortunately, because I think the discussion is growing and evolving. Um, but um, it, it definitely wasn't enough back then. So we got together um, and we, um, we said that we... We started, so I'm going to do a very hard fast forward here because the process was a bit more complicated. But we got together and we said that we want to, um, we started talking about possible solutions or approaches and we figured that we needed a new funding program. Um, and the mission of it was to support the development, improvement and maintenance of open digital infrastructure with the goal to sustainably strengthen the open source ecosystem with a focus on security, resilience, technological diversity and the people behind the code. So a strong focus on maintenance of existing stuff. So there needs to be a fund that supports you in improving or maintaining the technologies that you have. Uh, also a fund that sort of looks at the people behind the code. So what does the open source ecosystem and the communities actually need and that is sort of, you know, responsive to shifting and changing or specific needs in the field um, and also looking at the open source ecosystem with large. Um, fast forward, uh, we started thinking about this, we pitched a couple concepts and then we were commissioned by the Ministry of Economic Affairs and Climate, back then Economic Affairs, to write a feasibility study um, that allowed us to look a bit closer at the field and to understand who the, what the needs are, what the community is and what the field looks like. You can still, like we published the feasibility study last year, you can still download it from our website. It's available there. Um, and then again, fast forward, we pitched this fund, we said we need a new funding program that is dedicated specifically to open source infrastructure. And then I think it was, uh, then the election happened, um, then we weren't, like th there was a lot of open source and coalition contract, but we weren't there. Then Log4j happened. Um, fast forward to this year, June, um, we finally got funding for this year by the federal government um, to build up the fund. It was, uh, among, since we're among us, the stream and the recording, but um, there was frankly speaking quite late in the year, but uh, that's apparently how it works. But we were super excited that we got the funding um, and uh, we tried to make it available to the community as fast as possible. So we figured the best way to do this is set up a pilot round and we asked the community for recommendations for critical projects that need support. Um, we also wanted to make sure that we have sort of different types of projects that allow us to test our assumptions and to learn and also show to the world what we mean with open source infrastructure. And um, I, would, I would, so this is the pilot round. Um, those were selected this year. We got recommendations together with the board and a few experts in the field. We selected these projects. I would love to talk about these, um, uh, but we don't really have the time, but I can strongly, I really can recommend you to go to the website. We tried our best to explain these because sometimes it feels like this is a very technical thing, but it really affects every one of us. And all of these are extremely important and they all are also important for you. Uh, maybe not all of them depends if you're using PGP and so on, but um, OpenSSH is important, curl is important, OpenBGBD, like at least you're using tools or you're working with tools that are dependent on these or are going to use those. Um, and so we have protocols here, we even have a programming language. Um, we have um, people working on like different implementations of PGP. We have curl in there, which was kind of an obvious choice, but also um, it was, it, it's good to work with curl because it sort of makes it very clear how, how very, um, um, how would you call it? Um, like that, that those uh, core technologies are really everywhere. Um, yeah, but as I said, uh, I, I warmly invite you to look at these projects on our website. Um, so, 
where we are today, um, the last month with the pilot round and everything have been quite busy, uh, but um, I'm very happy to announce that we got our budget for next year confirmed. We also have a certain budget confirmed for 2024. Um, yeah, it's uh, so much work. <laughs> Thank, thank you so much. Um, we are just as amazed as you are um, that this is working, that there are people listening to this, that there are people understanding what we want to do. Uh, we've got a pretty significant budget for next year. It's about 11.5 million. Uh, and we also have some budget guaranteed for 2024, uh, which means that, as I said, the last month have been very, very busy. And what we're doing now, since we have a bit of a breather since a couple of weeks, we are retreating a lot as a team and trying to figure out our strategy for next year, like listening to people, trying to uh, get a sense of where our priorities should be lying next year. That's also why we are seeking input. Two things that are definitely going to happen in January, where we will start really hard working in the background to set up an open application. We think that needs to come as fast as possible so that we can, allow, we can make it possible for people to send their applications and we can see what's out there in the field. Um, and the other big thing that we are working on is that we are setting up uh, its own organization that we are currently hosted at the Sprint, which is a fellow agency and allows us to get, be operative. Um, but uh, we are currently looking and investigating a little bit what that organization needs to be to really cater to the needs of the people in the field because procurement is hard. Um, it's not, let me say it this way, it's not 100% fit for the needs of the open source infrastructure community and the work that they are doing. So there's sort of a mismatch and um, we have to figure out what kind of procurement methods, tools and instruments we can use to make this as little as, bur like to make it not burdensome for people to apply, to make it easily accessible and also we have a really big diversity of actors in the field. We have individuals, we have companies, we have, you know, and we're trying to figure out how we can support these the best way. So this is where we are, just in very broad strokes, and I will hand it over to Tara, who's going to share some thoughts we have about um, how to support the community. Thank you, Fiona. <laughs> so thank you, everyone. I'm Tara Tarakia. I'm a FOSS technologist. This is my favorite XKCD. Um, I've been supporting FOSS in, in, in human rights and tech communities uh, for 10 years now through my work with the Jordan Open Source Association and the Association for Progressive Communications. Um, after that, I also joined Fiona at OTF where we were funding privacy enhancing technologies and censorship circumvention. In general, I, like, I would describe myself as an internet infrastructure and policy geek. Uh, and for my role at SDF, I help the team sort of with the collecting and sharing of the input from, from the FOSS community, uh, help advise on programmatic priorities, uh, help with the evaluation of the projects and design criteria for potential funding along with our research team, and then follow updates and emerging issues in the field. Um, oh. So, uh, I want to talk a bit about sort of like our future work or the areas we want to focus on. And just as a disclaimer, this is all preliminary work. So it's all evolving. It depends on sort of all the input that we're going to hear from the community and also as our strategy evolves. Um, and also like one other thing is we want to keep in mind as we're sort of building on this work and building our future plans is how do we avoid, we want to support inf critical infrastructure, but we don't want to become critical infrastructure ourselves. Um, we don't want to become sort of like another breaking point and learn from the, learn from the past, from the mistakes, from um, situations we've been where like threatening one fund, uh, threatened like a whole community of practice. Uh, so we hope to be sort of a proof of concept that funding Public funding for open source is something that works and is something that more people should be doing. So again, yeah, evolving proof of concept and not like a panacea or one solution for everything. And the way we're doing that, I think, we've, as we demonstrated like through our pilot round, is we want to address the immediate needs of FOSS projects. Uh, we trust that projects often know sort of like the main problems that they're facing. So we want to work, work with our partners, work with the projects, help co-design our programs in order to meet their immediate needs. Uh, other than that, we also want to work in sort of a couple of key thematic areas. I think 
um, we're identifying those as we go, but some of the stuff that we came across is uh, issues such as securing the open source uh, ecosystem, which is, it's a very hot topic right now, like lots of people are talking about it, particularly I'm sure you might have heard the headline sort of supply chain security. I'm not sure I like that term. I don't think it fits the, the needs or sort of like the motivations of people within open source might sort of represent any other people's interests, but I think it's a symptom, like the fact that it's being taken so seriously, I think it's a symptom of a larger insecurity of, there's not, not enough security in, in, in how we develop our tools and how developers, and there's lots of room for error there. So we wanna help support folks be more secure, um, particularly developers and the users of our tools. Another, another, thing, another thing we've identified, and this is also another example, for example, is uh, post-quantum migration. So, um, <laughs> post-quantum migration. So, uh, quantum computers are coming. Nobody knows when, 10, 20 years, but they're coming. And once they come, uh, quantum crypto analysis is gonna break the encryptions that we rely on today. So that basically affects every one of us. So. Obviously, like this is an issue that's being taken seriously currently. There's lots of work being done on developing algorithms or encryption algorithms that are resistant to quantum crypto analysis. Uh, but someone needs to also be representing sort of like the public interest. We can't let that conversation and that work happen in the hands of governments, uh, cybersecurity areas, and um, companies. Uh, so that's something we want to be interested in sort of and we're already helping uh, with some of our projects, helping them adopt some of these uh, um, quantum resistant or post-quantum uh, encryption algorithms. Finally, yeah, we wanna also support baseline digital technologies. This is technologies that everyone relies on, uh, um, things that you would expect to have. Um, and as always, like this is in, in our key thematic areas, this is something we're always looking for input. So I really encourage you to reach out and, um, yeah, let us know. Um, another thing we wanted to help work on is sort of technical depth and baseline project help. We wanna help projects. Um, these are the things that are least likely to get funded, especially if you're like an open source project and you rely, for example, on like contracts from companies or things like that. They always wanna fund the features that work for them, but they wouldn't fund the general health of your project or making sure that like you have a healthy code base. Uh, so we wanna sort of reverse that trend and help projects uh, take care of these um, priorities. Uh, so in terms of intermediate goals, um, we wanna help projects move from ad hoc maintenance, which is how lots of open source software these days is being maintained, into uh, long-term planning, having, uh, giving them the security and to be able to think in a sustainable way Another thing we want to do is also invest in the science of maintenance, so helping sort of formalize, because there might be ad hoc models, but some of them are working, so we want to look at sort of how different projects are being maintained, how they've been maintaining themselves, and see how we can take that knowledge and spread it across the community, help turn success stories into uh, communities of practice, and help people, uh, help increase the general overall um, um, working of how that work. And, and finally, we wanna help work on onboarding and growing the FOSS community by bringing in more people um, to help sort of sustain the field beyond the life of the fund. So um, finally, like this all leads into our long-term impact or we will see how we see, how we see, how we wanna see the field like after we, uh, we beyond, beyond our lifetime, which is we wanna see public support for open source increase and, or as you say in German, like this digital designs for Zorga, that this is something that's acknowledged and recognized. Uh, another thing we wanna see is investment in infrastructure and maintenance being seen just as important as investing in new, uh, in new stuff or new and shiny tools. Finally, um, we wanna see that the public interest is strongly represented and even as the technology is rapidly developing that this is not left in the hands of companies uh, or just being developed without care for uh, human rights or people's uh, privacy or security. And finally, we, we want to leave the field with a strong and robust and well-funded and secure ecosystem in the public interest. Um, yep, that's it from my end.
we have some questions, right? We do. So thank you very much for listening in. Those are our email addresses. Uh, please feel free to reach out if you have any questions or you want to get in touch. Um, we're here for the Q&A now. We also brought two questions with us, um, something that we are we're wrapping our heads around a lot of questions right now, but something that we would love to get input in. Um, what, from your perspective, a lot of you are involved in open source work or in the technical field, fields. Um, if there are any emerging challenges that the SCF should keep an eye out for, um, I would say for next year, but then again, also long term. Um, yeah, and if you have any thoughts about what the SCF should not do. We are really bad at this, finding out what we <laughs> should be doing, but um, I think there are like good reasons or there might be good reasons for things that we shouldn't be investing in, that we shouldn't be, um, you know, for whatever reason, maybe there's someone else who's working on this or maybe, um, I don't know, uh, totally open for your input here and um, yeah, that's it. So I will come with the mic to you if you show me your hand. <laughs> Hi, and uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, I'm coming from a feminist perspective, and open source is a very male-dominated field. So if I'm not mistaking, please correct me, 3 to 5% of open source programmers or just being uh, working in that field are uh, female, and we're not even, speak not even speaking about trans people or more than just in the binary system. How do you address this challenge in your funding system? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's a very good question. And I would say that we are active in a field where things, like as you said, like it's even worse in open source. Um, I would say that it might even be worse in the main, like I'm probably making a big stretch here, but I would assume that it's even worse in open source infrastructure because it's so heavily volunteer based. Um, and we've actually seen over the, the past years, especially during Corona, things have just gotten worse in any domain that is volunteer focused or very heavily, uh, not dominated, but, but done by volunteers because work on volunteer stuff in your free time, it's just not possible if you have such a big imbalance for care work. So it's been really bad for the past years. I, um, so I've been working in, like I've been engaging very much in diversity efforts for more you know, diversity in tech and um, for me, funding is actually pretty much linked to this. I do think that money does play a role for these reasons, that heavily volunteer-based work is a privilege that, like doing volunteer work is a privilege that a lot of people don't have. So I would say that um, money can be one of the solutions. Um, also, like often enough, it's not, but in this case, I would actually say that it could play an important role, making this field more accessible, um, make it less only like, have money or free time be the gatekeeping factor here. Um, but I would say that there needs to be, a lot of work needs to be done. Uh, we see that they have, a, I'm already always taking the, the English word, but nachwuchs, like we have a, not only diversity problem, but um, uh, the, the field is, no. yeah, the, the field is really, really old. Like it's growing older and older. So, and there are not a lot of people coming into these places and spaces. Um, and there are like some really strong structural, but also social and cultural problems at hand that we need to address. Um, and I would say that um, besides like money can be part of the solution, but I think a fund needs to find out what other services they can offer that are not money, but you know, it could be consultancies or working with people to set up a proper governance model. Uh, and I think governance models are actually really important for these spaces um, and the lack of governance models can actually sometimes lead to really, really big problems. Um, so we are thinking about different ways or uh, the, the places where we used to work before, uh, for example, OTF had stuff like a community lab that enabled people to host events and have new people join these spaces. Um, so we don't have like the, the, the set bouquet of things that we want to work on, but I do think that there are things that can be done and we've seen very, very successful models out um, there. Like the outreach program has been incredibly successful at getting people actually also in the open source infrastructure space and the, or the, the race course sum of code um, or the code curious initiative in itself. So I would also love to see how we can support these existing initiatives and in continuing their work. Um, but yeah, those are just like s some spontaneous things that come to my head. I, I, do you want to add something? No, um, not much. Just, yeah, I think what you said and also in addition to that, I think some of the, we talked about like solving some of the problems with uh, 
uh, would like moving from this sort of like ad hoc into sort of like a long term planning. I think that will help a lot. Like, because also like um, at least like the, from talking talking to some of the pro many projects, they do also want to see more like diversity within them. They do want to see new faces, new people. They don't don't always want to because uh, that ultimately like means a better health for their project, and they can add, um, uh, and they can they can help them sort of grow. But it's definitely something that. Uh, projects struggle with when their immediate priority is like how do we keep this tool from breaking and that's that's the mood they're running in this emergency mood so um, because I think like diversity like many things it's not just something that you can solve with resources but also requires leadership it requires um, community management and and those are the first things that go away when you're always in this emergency mode thank you so the next question is over here so yeah, thank you for your work. And um, just asking if you're so you, right now you're uh, operating on a federal level. You have a federal ministry behind you. So do you think it's possible to be a role model for um, the federal states that they are um, also doing force funding agencies on their level, and there's not only one in Germany? Yeah, <clears throat> you mean um, on Bundesstaaten, Bundesländer even? Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think with everything, as, as Sarah said before, um, the challenges that we are trying to think about from the very beginning and how we design the program is that we don't become infrastructure ourselves, but that everything, I mean, we, we have this discussion sometimes that I, I sometimes feel, or like, I used to think that the sovereign tech fund shouldn't actually have to exist for a long time. It should, but on the other hand, we are, we are addressing really hard problems that, and tricky problems like diversity or like the growth of the field that will take a longer time than just five years. So we'll probably uh, be around a bit longer uh, than I had hoped. But, um, but yeah, uh, just saying that I think in order to be sustainable and to leverage the impact that we have, we always have to think about how can we incentivize more people to get into the field. Like, it, this is not about pushing anyone out of the field. It actually is about getting more people into the field. It's about, it is about companies taking their share and like doing the responsible thing here. It is about more governments. I don't know, on the EU level, maybe federal states level, communal level, um, private money level, um, and also potentially international, um, um, international organizations as well getting into the game. So whatever we are doing, we are trying to do it in a way that we can prepare or harvest what we learn and make it accessible to other funders. And we are trying to make a case here. So we, we are, um, t just to say this quickly, we are actually quite fortunate, I think, in the way that our funders in the Ministry of Economic Affairs and Climate, they understand that we are an iterative program. So we, are, we have the freedom to test things and to figure out if those are working. Like we can explore ideas and we can show if these work or not. I mean, there are like so many things that we could be doing. We can provide money, but there are so many more things, right? We could also think about, you know, um, what would it look like if we hired two developers who work on open source projects full time? Like, is that something that would work? Uh, is that something that would be viable? Is that something that is a, a appropriate model maybe for governments as well? Like, how, what does it look like if we, you know, like what should our role be? So j just to um, give a shorter answer, um, yeah, we are definitely thinking about how we can create a, a blue, what do you call it? Um, Blueprint, thank you. Or proof of concept. A proof of concept, much better, um, for others to work on and how we can share those learnings from the very start. Um, if that's, I think, I don't know if it's likely, but it definitely becomes more likely if you work that way and make your stuff available. Yeah. I actually had it in my notes, but I didn't see it. Well, like, I think, like, for me, like, my, um, speaking, like, in my ambition, like, I would really love it if, like, it happened on every level, like, from municipal to state to federal to like EU and international and but yeah for us like we just we, we need to figure out like for us at this stage like how do we make this work how do we prove the value how and it's definitely something we, we want to do so I also uh, if you are someone who can help us to you know get in touch with people or you know people who would like to talk about this we are I like the idea of open sourcing a fund, so um, whatever we can share and like help people setting things up, we're here to help. Oh. So we're taking one last uh, um, question or maybe comment. Uh, yeah, I was uh, thinking about uh, what, what not to do. And uh, I feel like uh, it's kind of a, 
a political question, like what kind of infrastructure is considered uh, essential? Like if I'm thinking about cryptocurrency and all of this stuff, I think lots of people would uh, consider this essential, but other people wouldn't. And I think like that's a really uh, hard problem to solve for you. Like what projects not to fund because you don't consider them essential and who decides on on that. I don't know if you have already thought about this or like what your thoughts are on that, but that came to my mind. <laughs> so it's, it's something we definitely thought about. I think like two particular fields where like I think like have been sort of in research identified as essential, but for us uh, definitely like we didn't see them as a priority now because there's so much investment being put in them by others is, is for example digital wallets and cryptocurrencies and also the field of digital identity because um, I mean at this stage I feel like uh, and we don't know enough and please let us know if you have ideas we don't think we can do anything constructive there there's so much work being done by so many actors and for us like we want to focus on the areas that are um, that we do see as has not been given attention to, and like I said, we're not looking at the sort of like the shiny new thing. We're looking at main, the maintenance of infrastructure and the building of infrastructure. Maybe like we, it's not like we won't like support new things, but we should build new things that nobody's talking about, but people need, and, and that's where our focus is, rather than things that already like there's lots of people talking about and lots of funding exists. Uh, So I saw one, one last question. No, okay. <laughs> I, I already gave this. No, it's too late. <laughs> uh, answer. So thank you, Fiona. Thank you, Tara, thank you, for everyone. this uh, very enriching presentation and discussion. <laughs> and I very much love the sustainability. Sustainability, sustainability. <laughs>